Part One of Rain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times. Rain, by W. Somerset Maugham, Part One. It was nearly bedtime, and when they awoke next morning, land would be in sight. Dr. Macphail lit his pipe, and, leaning over the rail, searched the heavens for the Southern Cross. After two years at the front, and a wound that had taken longer to heal than it should, he was glad to settle down, quietly, at Appia, for twelve months at least, and he felt already better for the journey. Since some of the passengers were leaving the ship next day at Pago Pago, they had had a little dance that evening, and in his ears hammered still the harsh notes of the mechanical piano. But the deck was quiet at last. A little way off he saw his wife in a long chair talking with the Davidsons, and he strolled over to her. When he sat down under the light and took off his hat, you saw that he had very red hair, with a bald patch on the crown, and the red freckled skin which accompanies red hair. He was a man of forty, thin, with a pinched face, precise and rather pedantic, and he spoke with a Scots accent, in a very low, quiet voice. Between the Macphails and the Davidsons, who were missionaries, there had arisen the intimacy of shipboard, which is due to propinquity rather than to any community of taste. Their chief tie was the disapproval they shared of the men who spent their days and nights in the smoking-room playing poker or bridge and drinking. Mrs. Macphail was not a little flattered to think that she and her husband were the only people on board with whom the Davidsons were willing to associate, and even the doctor, shy but no fool, half unconsciously acknowledged the compliment. It was only because he was of an argumentative mind that in their cabin at night he permitted himself to carp. Mrs. Davidson was saying she didn't know how they'd have got through the journey if it hadn't been for us, said Mrs. Macphail, as she neatly brushed out her transformation. She said we were really the only people on the ship that cared to know. I shouldn't have thought a missionary was such a big bug that he could afford to put on frills. It's not frills. I quite understand what she means. It wouldn't have been very nice for the Davidsons to have a mix with all that rough lot in the smoking room. The founder of the religion wasn't so exclusive, said Dr. Macphail with a chuckle. I've asked you over and over again not to joke about religion, answered his wife. I shouldn't like to have a nature like yours, Alec. You never look for the best in people. He gave her a sidelong glance with his pale blue eyes, but did not reply. After many years of married life, he had learned that it was more conducive to peace to leave his wife with the last word. He was undressed before she was, and climbing into the upper bunk, he settled down to read himself to sleep. When he came on deck next morning, they were close to land. He looked at it with greedy eyes. There was a thin strip of silver beach rising quickly to hills covered to the top with luxuriant vegetation. The coconut trees, thick and green, came nearly to the water's edge, and among them you saw the grass houses of the Samoans, and here and there, gleaming white, a little church. Mrs. Davidson came and stood beside him. She was dressed in black, and wore round her neck a gold chain, from which dangled a small cross. She was a little woman, with brown dull hair, very elaborately arranged, and she had prominent blue eyes behind invisible pince-nez. Her face was long, like a sheep's, but she gave no impression of foolishness, rather of extreme alertness. She had the quick movements of a bird. The most remarkable thing about her was her voice, high, metallic, and without inflection. It fell on the air with a hard monotony, irritating to the nerves like the pitiless clamor of the pneumatic drill. 
this must seem like home to you said dr macphail with his thin difficult smile ours are low islands you know not like these coral these are volcanic we've got another ten days journey to reach them in these parts that's almost like being in the next street at home said dr macphail facetiously well that's rather an exaggerated way of putting it but one does look at distances differently in the south seas so far you're right dr macphail sighed faintly i'm glad we're not stationed here she went on they say this is a terribly difficult place to work in the steamers touching makes the people unsettled and then there's the naval station that's bad for the natives in our district we don't have difficulties like that to contend with. There are one or two traders, of course, but we take care to make them behave, and if they don't, we make the place so hot for them, they're glad to go. Fixing the glasses on her nose, she looked at the green island with a ruthless stare. It's almost a hopeless task for the missionaries here. I can never be sufficiently thankful to God that we are at least spared that. Davidson's district consisted of a group of islands to the north of Samoa. They were widely separated, and he had frequently to go long distances by canoe. At these times his wife remained at their headquarters and managed the mission. Dr. Macphail felt his heart sink when he considered the efficiency with which she certainly managed it. She spoke of the depravity of the natives in a voice which nothing could hush, but with a vehemently unctuous horror. Her sense of delicacy was singular. Early in their acquaintance she had said to him, "'You know, their marriage customs, when we first settled in the islands, were so shocking that I couldn't possibly describe them to you. But I'll tell Mrs. Macphail, and she'll tell you. Then he had seen his wife and Mrs. Davidson, their deck chairs close together, in earnest conversation for about two hours. As he walked past them backwards and forwards for the sake of exercise, he had heard Mrs. Davidson's agitated whisper, like the distant flow of a mountain torrent, and he saw by his wife's open mouth and pale face that she was enjoying an alarming experience. At night in their cabin she repeated to him with bated breath all she had heard. "'Well, what did I say to you?' cried Mrs. Davidson, exultant next morning. "'Did you ever hear anything more dreadful? You don't wonder that I couldn't tell you myself, do you? Even though you are a doctor.' Mrs. Davidson scanned his face. She had a dramatic eagerness to see that she had achieved the desired effect. "'Can you wonder that when we first went there our hearts sank? You'll hardly believe me when I tell you it was impossible to find a single good girl in any of the villages.' She used the word good in a severely technical manner. "'Mr. Davidson and I talked it over.' and we made up our minds the first thing to do was to put down the dancing. The natives were crazy about dancing. I was not averse to it myself when I was a young man, said Dr. Macphail. I guessed as much when I heard you ask Mrs. Macphail to have a turn with you last night. I don't think there's any real harm if a man dances with his wife, but I was relieved that she wouldn't. Under the circumstances, I thought it better that we should keep ourselves to ourselves. "'Under what circumstances?' Mrs. Davidson gave him a quick look through her pince-nez, but did not answer his question. "'But among white people it's not quite the same,' she went on. "'Though I must say I agree with Mr. Davidson, who says he can't understand how a husband can stand by and see his wife in another man's arms. And as far as I'm concerned, I've never danced a step since I married.' But the native dancing is quite another matter. It's not only immoral in itself, but it distinctly leads to immorality. However, I'm thankful to God 
that we stamped it out. And I don't think I'm wrong in saying that no one has danced in our district for eight years. But now they came to the mouth of the harbor, and Mrs. MacPhail joined them. The ship turned sharply and steamed slowly in. It was a great landlocked harbor big enough to hold a fleet of battleships, and all around it rose, high and steep, the green hills. Near the entrance, getting such breeze as blew from the sea, stood the governor's house in a garden. The stars and stripes dangled languidly from a flagstaff. They passed two or three trim bungalows and a tennis court, and then they came to the quay with its warehouses. Mrs. Davidson pointed out the schooner, moored two or three hundred yards from the side, which was to take them to Apia. There was a crowd of eager, noisy, and good-humoured natives, come from all parts of the island, some from curiosity, others to barter with the travellers on their way to Sydney, and they brought pineapples and huge bunches of bananas, tappa cloths, necklaces of shells or shark's teeth, kava bowls, and models of war canoes. American sailors, neat and trim, clean-shaven and frank of face, sauntered among them, and there was a little group of officials. While their luggage was being landed, the MacPhails and Mrs. Davidson watched the crowd. Dr. MacPhail looked at the yaws from which most of the children and the young boys seemed to suffer, disfiguring sores like torpid ulcers, and his professional eyes glistened when he saw for the first time, in his experience, cases of elephantiasis, men going about with a huge, heavy arm, or dragging along a grossly disfigured leg. Men and women wore the lava-lava. "'It's a very indecent costume,' said Mrs. Davidson. "'Mr. Davidson thinks it should be prohibited by law. How can you expect people to be moral when they wear nothing but a strip of red cotton round their loins?' "'It's suitable enough for the climate,' said the doctor, wiping the sweat off his head. Now that they were on land, the heat, though it was so early in the morning, was already oppressive, closed in by its hills, and not a breath of air came in to Pago Pago. "'In our islands,' Mrs. Davidson went on, in her high-pitched tones, "'we practically eradicated the lava-lava. A few old men still continue to wear it, but that's all. The women have all taken to the Mother Hubbard, and the men wear trousers and singlets.' At the very beginning of our stay, Mr. Davidson said in one of his reports, the inhabitants of these islands will never be thoroughly Christianized till every boy of more than ten years is made to wear a pair of trousers. But Mrs. Davidson had given two or three of her bird-like glances at heavy gray clouds that came floating over the mouth of the harbor. A few drops began to fall. "'We'd better take shelter,' she said. They made their way, with all the crowd, to a great shed of corrugated iron, and the rain began to fall in torrents. They stood there for some time, and then were joined by Mr. Davidson. He had been polite enough to the MacPhails during the journey, but he had not his wife's sociability, and had spent much of his time reading. He was a silent, rather sullen man, and you felt that his affability was a duty that he imposed upon himself Christianly. He was by nature reserved and even morose. His appearance was singular. He was very tall and thin, with long limbs loosely jointed, hollow cheeks and curiously high cheekbones. He had so cadaverous an air that it surprised you to notice how full and sensual were his lips. He wore his hair very long. His dark eyes, set deep in their sockets, were large and tragic, and his hands, with their big long fingers, were finely shaped. They gave him a look of great strength. But the most striking thing about him was the feeling he gave you of suppressed fire. It was impressive and vaguely troubling. He was not a man with whom any intimacy was possible. He brought now unwelcome news. There was an epidemic of measles, 
a serious and often fatal disease among the Kanakas on the island, and a case had developed among the crew of the schooner which was to take them on their journey. The sick man had been brought ashore and put in hospital on the quarantine station, but telegraphic instructions had been sent from Appia to say that the schooner would not be allowed to enter the harbor till it was certain no other member of the crew was affected. It means we shall have to stay here for ten days at least. But I'm urgently needed at Appia, said Dr. Macphail. That can't be helped. If no more cases develop on board, the schooner will be allowed to sail with white passengers, but all native traffic is prohibited for three months. Is there a hotel here? asked Mrs. Macphail. Davidson gave a low chuckle. There's not. What shall we do, then? I've been talking to the governor. There's a trader along the front who has rooms that he rents, and my proposition is that as soon as the rain lets up, we should go along there and see what we can do. Don't expect comfort. You've just got to be thankful if we get a bed to sleep on and a roof over our heads. But the rain showed no sign of stopping, and at length, with umbrellas and waterproofs, they set out. There was no town, but merely a group of official buildings, a store or two, and, at the back, among the coconut trees and plantains, a few native dwellings. The house they sought was about five minutes' walk from the wharf. It was a frame house of two stories, with broad verandas on both floors, and a roof of corrugated iron. The owner was a half-caste named Horn, with a native wife surrounded by little brown children, and on the ground floor he had a store where he sold canned goods and cottons. The rooms he showed them were almost bare of furniture. In the Macphails there was nothing but a poor worn bed with a ragged mosquito net, a rickety chair, and a washstand. They looked round with dismay. The rain poured down without ceasing. I'm not going to unpack more than we actually need, said Mrs. Macphail. Mrs. Davidson came into the room as she was unlocking a portmanteau. She was very brisk and alert. The cheerless surroundings had no effect on her. If you take my advice, you'll get a needle and cotton and start right in to mend the mosquito net, she said, or you'll not be able to get a wink of sleep tonight. Will they be very bad? asked Dr. Macphail. This is the season for them. When you're asked to a party at Government House at Appia, you'll notice that all the ladies are given a pillow slip to put their their lower extremities in. I wish the rain would stop for a moment, said Mrs. Macphail. I could try to make the place comfortable with more heart if the sun were shining. Oh, if you wait for that, you'll wait a long time. Pago Pago is about the rainiest place in the Pacific. You see, the hills and that bay, they attract the water, and one expects rain at this time of year anyway. She looked from Macphail to his wife, standing helplessly in different parts of the room, like lost souls, and she pursed her lips. She saw that she must take them in hand. Feckless people like that made her impatient, but her hands itched to put everything in order, which came so naturally to her. Here, you give me a needle and cotton, and I'll mend that net of yours, while you go on with your unpacking. Dinner's at one. Dr. Macphail, you'd better go down to the wharf and see that your heavy luggage has been put in a dry place. You know what these natives are. They're quite capable of storing it, where the rain will beat in on it all the time. The doctor put on his waterproof again, and went downstairs. At the door, Mr. Horn was standing in conversation with the quartermaster of the ship they had just arrived in, and a second-class passenger, whom Dr. Macphail had seen several times on board. The quartermaster, a little shriveled man, extremely dirty, nodded to him as he passed. "'This is a bad job about the measles, Doc,' he said. "'I see you've fixed yourself up already.' Dr. Macphail thought he was rather familiar, but he was a timid man, and he did not take offense easily. 
Yes, we've got a room upstairs. Miss Thompson was sailing with you to Appia, so I brought her along here. The quartermaster pointed with his thumb to the woman standing by his side. She was twenty-seven, perhaps, plump, and, in a coarse fashion, pretty. She wore a white dress and a large white hat. Her fat calves in white cotton stockings bulged over the tops of long white boots and glacé kid. She gave Macphail an ingratiating smile. "'The feller's trying to soak me a dollar and a half a day for the meanest-sized room,' she said in a hoarse voice. "'I tell you, she's a friend of mine, Joe,' said the quartermaster. "'She can't pay more than a dollar, and you've sure got to take her for that.' The trader was fat and smooth and quietly smiling. "'Well, if you put it like that, Mr. Swan, I'll see what I can do about it. I'll talk to Mrs. Horn, and if we think we can make a reduction, we will.' "'Don't try to pull that stuff with me,' said Miss Thompson. "'We'll settle this right now. You get a dollar a day for the room, and not one bean more.' Dr. Macphail smiled. He admired the effrontery with which she bargained. He was the sort of man who had always paid what he was asked. He preferred to be overcharged than to haggle. The trader sighed. "'Well, to oblige Mr. Swan, I'll take it.' "'That's the goods,' said Miss Thompson. "'Come right in and have a shot of hooch. I've got some real good rye in that grip, if you'll bring it along, Mr. Swan. You come along, too, doctor.' "'Oh, I don't think I will. Thank you,' he answered. "'I'm just going down to see that our luggage is all right.' He stepped out into the rain. It swept in from the opening of the harbour in sheets, and the opposite shore was all blurred. He passed two or three natives clad in nothing but the lava-lava, with huge umbrellas over them. They walked finely, with leisurely movements, very upright and they smiled and greeted him in a strange tongue as they went by. It was nearly dinner-time when he got back, and their meal was laid in the trader's parlour. It was a room designed not to live in, but for purposes of prestige, and it had a musty, melancholy air. A suite of stamped plush was arranged neatly round the walls, and from the middle of the ceiling, protected from the flies by yellow tissue paper, hung a gilt chandelier. Davidson did not come. "'I know he went to call on the governor,' said Mrs. Davidson, "'and I guess he's kept him to dinner.' A little native girl brought them a dish of hamburger steak, and after a while the trader came up to see that they had everything they wanted. "'I see we have a fellow lodger, Mr. Horn,' said Dr. Macphail. "'She's taken a room, that's all.' answered the trader. She's getting her own board. He looked at the two ladies with an obsequious air. I put her downstairs so she shouldn't be in the way. She won't be any trouble to you. Is it someone who was on the boat? asked Mrs. Macphail. Yes, ma'am. She was in the second cabin. She was going to Appia. She had a position as a cashier waiting for her. Oh! When the trader was gone, Macphail said, I shouldn't think she'd find it exactly cheerful having her meals in her room. "'If she was in the second cabin, I guess she'd rather,' answered Mrs. Davidson. "'I don't exactly know who it can be.' "'I happened to be there when the quartermaster brought her along. Her name's Thompson.' "'It's not the woman who was dancing with the quartermaster last night?' asked Mrs. Davidson. "'That's who it must be.' said Mrs. Macphail. I wondered at the time what she was. She looked rather fast to me. "'Not a good style at all,' said Mrs. Davidson. They began to talk of other things, and after dinner, tired with their early rise, they separated and slept. When they awoke, though the sky was still grey and the clouds hung low, it was not raining, and they went for a walk on the high road which the Americans had built along the bay. On their return, they found that Davidson had just come in. "'We may be here for a fortnight,' he said irritably. "'I've argued it out with the governor, but he says there is nothing to be done.' 
Mr. Davidson's just longing to get back to his work, said his wife, with an anxious glance at him. We've been away for a year, he said, walking up and down the veranda. The mission has been in charge of native missionaries, and I'm terribly nervous that they let things slide. They're good men. I'm not saying a word against them. God-fearing, devout, and truly Christian men. Their Christianity would put many so-called Christians at home to blush. But they're pitifully lacking in the energy. They can make a stand once. They can make a stand twice. But they can't make a stand all the time. If you leave a mission in charge of a native missionary, no matter how trustworthy he seems, in course of time you'll find he's let abuses creep in. Mr. Davidson stood still, with his tall spare form and his great eyes flashing out of his pale face. He was an impressive figure. His sincerity was obvious in the fire of his gestures and in his deep ringing voice. I expect to have my work cut out for me. I shall act, and I shall act promptly. If the tree is rotten, it shall be cut down and cast into the flames. And in the evening, after the high tea, which was their last meal, while they sat in the stiff parlor, the ladies working, and Dr. Macphail smoking his pipe, the missionary told them of his work in the islands. When we went there, they had no sense of sin at all, he said. They broke the commandments one after the other, and never knew they were doing wrong. And I think that was the most difficult part of my work, to instill into the natives the sense of sin. The Macphails knew already that Davidson had worked in the Solomons for five years before he met his wife. She had been a missionary in China, and they had become acquainted in Boston, where they were both spending part of their leave to attend a missionary congress. On their marriage they had been appointed to the islands in which they had labored ever since. In the course of all the conversations they had had with Mr. Davidson, one thing had shown out clearly, and that was the man's unflinching courage. He was a medical missionary, and he was liable to be called at any time to one or another of the islands in the group. Even the whaleboat is not so very safe a conveyance in the stormy Pacific of the wet season, but often he would be sent for in a canoe, and the danger was great. In cases of illness or accident he never hesitated. A dozen times he had spent the whole night bailing for his life, and more than once Mrs. Davidson had given him up for lost. "'I beg him not to go sometimes,' she said, "'or at least to wait till the weather was more settled, but he'd never listen. He's obstinate, and when he's once made up his mind, nothing can move him. How can I ask the natives to put their trust in the Lord, if I am afraid to do so myself? cried Davidson. And I'm not, I'm not. They know that if they send for me in their trouble, I'll come if it's humanly possible. And do you think the Lord is going to abandon me when I am on his business? The wind blows at his bidding, and the waves toss and rage at his word. Dr. Macphail was a timid man. He had never been able to get used to the hurtling of the shells over the trenches, and when he was operating in an advanced dressing station, the sweat poured from his brow and dimmed his spectacles in the effort he made to control his unsteady hand. He shuddered a little as he looked at the missionary. "'I wish I could say that I've never been afraid,' he said. I wish you could say that you believed in God, retorted the other. But for some reason, that evening, the missionary's thoughts traveled back to the early days he and his wife had spent on the islands. Sometimes Mrs. Davidson and I would look at one another, and the tears would stream down our cheeks. We worked without ceasing, day and night, and we seemed to make no progress. I don't know what I should have done without her then. When I felt my heart sink, when I was very near despair, she gave me courage and hope. Mrs. Davidson looked down at her work, and a slight color rose to her thin cheeks. Her hands trembled a little. She did not trust herself to speak. 
We had no one to help us. We were alone, thousands of miles from any of our own people, surrounded by darkness. When I was broken and weary, she would put her work aside and take the Bible and read to me till peace came and settled upon me like sleep upon the eyelids of a child. And when at last she closed the book, she'd say, We'll save them in spite of themselves. And I felt strong again in the Lord, and I answered, Yes, with God's help I'll save them. I must save them. He came over to the table and stood in front of it, as though it were a lectern. You see, they were so naturally depraved that they couldn't be brought to see their wickedness. We had to make sins out of what they thought were natural actions. We had to make it a sin, not only to commit adultery, and to lie and thieve, but to expose their bodies, and to dance, and not to come to church. I made it a sin for a girl to show her bosom, and a sin for a man not to wear trousers. How? asked Dr. Macphail, not without surprise. I instituted fines. Obviously, the only way to make people realize that an action is sinful is to punish them if they commit it. I fined them if they didn't come to church, and I fined them if they danced. I fined them if they were improperly dressed. I had a tariff, and every sin had to be paid for, either in money or work. And at last I made them understand. But did they never refuse to pay? How could they? asked the missionary. It would be a brave man who tried to stand up against Mr. Davidson, said his wife, tightening her lips. Dr. Macphail looked at Davidson with troubled eyes. What he heard shocked him, but he hesitated to express his disapproval. You must remember that in the last resort I could expel them from their church membership. Did they mind that? Davidson smiled a little, and gently rubbed his hands. They couldn't sell their copra. When the men fished, they got no share of the catch. It meant something very like starvation. Yes, they minded quite a lot. Tell him about Fred Olson, said Mrs. Davidson. The missionary fixed his fiery eyes on Dr. Macphail. Fred Olson was a Danish trader who had been in the islands a good many years. He was a pretty rich man, as traders go, and he wasn't very pleased when we came. You see, he had things very much his own way. He paid the natives what he liked for the copra, and he paid in goods and whiskey. He had a native wife, but he was flagrantly unfaithful to her. He was a drunkard. I gave him a chance to mend his ways, but he wouldn't take it. He laughed at me. Davidson's voice fell to a deep bass as he said the last words, and he was silent for a minute or two. The silence was heavy with menace. In two years he was a ruined man. He'd lost everything he'd saved in a quarter of a century. I broke him, and at last he was forced to come to me like a beggar and beseech me to give him a passage back to Sydney. I wish you could have seen him when he came to see Mr. Davidson, said the missionary's wife. He had been a fine, powerful man with a lot of fat on him, and he had a great big voice, but now he was half the size, and he was shaking all over. He'd suddenly become an old man. With abstracted gaze, Davidson looked out into the night. The rain was falling again. Suddenly from below came a sound and Davidson turned and looked questioningly at his wife. It was the sound of a gramophone, harsh and loud, wheezing out a syncopated tune. "'What's that?' he asked. Mrs. Davidson fixed her pince-nez more firmly on her nose. "'One of the second-class passengers has a room in the house. I guess it comes from there.' They listened in silence, and presently they heard the sound of dancing. Then the music stopped and they heard the popping of corks, and voices raised in animated conversation. "'I dare say she's giving a farewell party to her friends on board,' said Dr. Macphail. "'The ship sails at twelve, doesn't it?' Davidson made no remark, but he looked at his watch. "'Are you ready?' he asked his wife. She got up and folded her work. "'Yes, I guess I am,' she answered. 
"'It's early to go to bed yet, isn't it?' said the doctor. "'We have a good deal of reading to do,' explained Mrs. Davidson. "'Wherever we are, we read a chapter of the Bible before retiring for the night, and we study it with the commentaries, you know, and discuss it thoroughly. It's a wonderful training for the mind.' The two couples bade one another good night. Doctor and Mrs. Macphail were left alone. For two or three minutes they did not speak. "'I think I'll go and fetch the cards,' the doctor said at last. Mrs. Macphail looked at him doubtfully. Her conversation with the Davidsons had left her a little uneasy, but she did not like to say that she thought they had better not play cards when the Davidsons might come in at any moment. Dr. Macphail brought them, and she watched him, though with a vague sense of guilt, while he laid out his patience. Below, the sound of revelry continued. It was fine enough next day, and the Macphails, condemned to spend a fortnight of idleness at Pago Pago, set about making the best of things. They went down to the quay and got out of their boxes a number of books. The doctor called on the chief surgeon of the naval hospital and went round the beds with him. They left cards on the governor. They passed Miss Thompson on the road. The doctor took off his hat, and she gave him a "'Good morning, Doc,' in a loud, cheerful voice. She was dressed as on the day before, in a white frock, and her shiny white boots with her high heels, her fat legs bulging over the tops of them, were strange things on that exotic scene. "'I don't think she's very suitably dressed, I must say.' said Mrs. Macphail. She looks extremely common to me. When they got back to their house, she was on the veranda playing with one of the trader's dark children. Say a word to her, Dr. Macphail whispered to his wife. She's all alone here, and it seems rather unkind to ignore her. Mrs. Macphail was shy, but she was in the habit of doing what her husband bade her. I think we're fellow lodgers here, she said rather foolishly. "'Terrible, ain't it, being cooped up in a one-horse burg like this?' answered Miss Thompson. "'And they tell me I'm lucky to have gotten a room. I don't see myself living in a native house, and that's what some have to do. I don't know why they don't have a hotel.' They exchanged a few more words. Miss Thompson, loud-voiced and garrulous, was evidently quite willing to gossip. But Mrs. Macphail had a poor stock of small talk, and presently she said, well, I think we must go upstairs. In the evening, when they sat down to their high tea, Davidson, on coming in, said, I see that woman downstairs has a couple of sailors sitting there. I wonder how she's gotten acquainted with them. She can't be very particular, said Mrs. Davidson. They were all rather tired after the idle, aimless day. If there's going to be a fortnight of this, I don't know what we shall feel like at the end of it, said Dr. Macphail. The only thing to do is to portion out the day to different activities, answered the missionary. I shall set aside a certain number of hours to study, and a certain number to exercise, rain or fine. In the wet season you can't afford to pay any attention to the rain, and a certain number to recreation. Dr. Macphail looked at his companion with misgiving. Davidson's program oppressed him. They were eating hamburger steak again. It seemed the only dish the cook knew how to make. Then below, the gramophone began. Davidson started nervously when he heard it, but said nothing. Men's voices floated up. Miss Thompson's guests were joining in a well-known song, and presently they heard her voice, too, hoarse and loud. There was a good deal of shouting and laughing. The four people upstairs, trying to make conversation, listened despite themselves to the clink of glasses and the scrape of chairs. More people had evidently come. Miss Thompson was giving a party. "'I wonder how she gets them all in,' said Mrs. Macphail, suddenly breaking into a medical conversation between the missionary and her husband. It showed whither her thoughts were wandering. The twitch of Davidson's face proved that, though he spoke of scientific things, his mind was busy in the same direction. Suddenly, while the doctor was giving some experience of practice on the Flanders front, rather prosily, he sprang to his feet with a cry. 
"'What's the matter, Alfred?' asked Mrs. Davidson. "'Of course. It never occurred to me. She's out of Iwele. "'She can't be.' "'She came on board at Honolulu. It's obvious. And she's carrying on her trade here. Here!' He uttered the last word with a passion of indignation. "'What's Iwele?' asked Mrs. Macphail. He turned his gloomy eyes on her, and his voice trembled with horror. "'The plague spot of Honolulu, the red-light district. It was a blot on our civilization.' Iwele was on the edge of the city. You went down side streets by the harbor, in the darkness, across a rickety bridge, till you came to a deserted road, all ruts and holes, and then suddenly you came out into the light. There was parking room for motors on each side of the road, and there were saloons, tawdry and bright, each one noisy with its mechanical piano, and there were barber shops and tobacconists. There was a stir in the air and a sense of expectant gaiety. You turned down a narrow alley, either to the right or to the left, for the road divided Iwele into two parts, and you found yourself in the district. There were rows of little bungalows, trim and neatly painted in green, and the pathway between them was broad and straight. It was laid out like a garden city. In its respectable regularity, its order and spruceness, it gave an impression of sardonic horror, for never can the search for love have been so systematized and ordered. The pathways were lit by a rare lamp but they would have been dark except for the delights that came from the open windows of the bungalows. Men wandered about, looking at the women who sat at their windows, reading or sewing, for the most part taking no notice of the passers-by, and like the women they were of all nationalities. There were Americans, sailors from the ships in port, enlisted men off the gunboats, somberly drunk, and soldiers from the regiments, white and black, quartered on the island, there were Japanese, walking in twos and threes, Hawaiians, Chinese in long robes, and Filipinos in preposterous hats. They were silent, and as it were, oppressed. Desire is sad. "'It was the most crying scandal of the Pacific,' exclaimed Davidson vehemently. "'The missionaries had been agitating against it for years, and at last the local press took it up. The police refused to stir. You know their argument. They say that vice is inevitable, and consequently the best thing is to localize and control it. The truth is, they were paid. Paid! They were paid by the saloon keepers, paid by the bullies, paid by the women themselves. At last they were forced to move. I read about it in the papers that came on board in Honolulu, said Dr. Macphail. Iwele! with its sin and shame, ceased to exist on the very day we arrived. The whole population was brought before the justices. I don't know why I didn't understand at once what that woman was. "'Now you come to speak of it,' said Mrs. McPhail. "'I remember seeing her come on board only a few minutes before the boat sailed. I remember thinking at the time she was cutting it rather fine.' "'How dare she come here!' cried Davidson indignantly. I'm not going to allow it. He strode towards the door. What are you going to do? asked Macphail. What do you expect me to do? I'm going to stop it. I'm not going to have this house turn into, into... He sought for a word that should not offend the lady's ears. His eyes were flashing, and his pale face was paler still in his emotion. It sounds as though there were three or four men down there said the doctor. Don't you think it's rather rash to go in just now? The missionary gave him a contemptuous look, and without a word flung out of the room. End of Part 1 Rain